our um, speaker today, uh, Sherry Fowler. But before uh, I do that, I just wanted to make a few announcements about upcoming events. Uh, it's a very busy time uh, for uh, the uh, Japanese studies community. Next Wednesday, uh, Ezra Vogel, um, uh, a professor emeritus of, uh, at Harvard, will be here, uh, and he's speaking on six decades of J uh, Japan social science. Uh, it's a really great opportunity to uh, meet uh, a real iconic figure in the field, uh, and uh, that will be um, uh, Wednesday, noon to one, uh, in the Ed Educational Conference Center, which is... Okay, on that side. Um, so that's uh, one. And of course, uh, uh, we have our continuing uh, noon lecture series. So next Thursday uh, is the, uh, there'll be uh, Dennis Frost uh, from Kalamazoo. We'll be talking about the Paralympic movement, disability, and sports in post war Japan. Very interesting. Uh, uh, um, uh, issue that I think uh, hasn't been uh, covered very widely. And then, of course, the um, uh, Studio Ghibli uh, collection um, uh, film series is continuing. And next Wednesday, uh, w they're screening Porco Rosso at 7 o'clock over in the State Theater. Is that right? Um, the M Michigan Theater? Sorry, I get them confused. In the Michigan Theater. So um, all of that is upcoming. Uh, but Right now, uh, we have a, uh, 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 right before us, we have our um, great guest here. Uh, Professor Fowler is, uh, teaches at the University of Kansas. Uh, she's been there since um, 2000, is that right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> this is, um, she's, uh, uh, she was actually coming from Lewis and Clark College, another uh, college that I have some connection to, so that's nice to uh, see. But um, she has really, her awards and publications are really too numerous to, uh, to mention, so I'll just give you a little sense of her um, uh, background and some of the things that um, led out of her work at different institutions, plus um, thinking about where, uh, what she's talking about today. Uh, her dissertation um, at, the, uh, at UCLA uh, from 1994 uh, was called Muroji, a Contextual Analysis of the Temple and Its Images. This led into a 2005 book uh, that um, many of us have read, I think all my graduate students have, uh, have read, um, called uh, Muroji, Rearranging Art and History at the Japanese Buddhist Temple. Uh, this is an uh, inspiring book for me. Uh, I think it's been a um, uh, really influential book for many people, thinking about um, uh, site-specific studies uh, of uh, Japanese uh, religion and Japanese art history. And, uh, it's a, uh, both a wonderful site, but um, the uh, book itself illuminates it, uh, the history and the culture in, in very deep and interesting ways. The, um, I saw that, uh, your, uh, that um, Professor Fowler's, uh, one of her minor areas in uh, graduate school was Japanese Edo period painting. Uh, I, uh, I, I'll have to hold her to that, um, but uh, that's in part what she's, uh, well, not exactly painting, but prints. Uh, she's talking about Japanese Edo materials today. So that's exciting uh, to see how um, some of these, uh, this uh, earlier work on um, the um, uh, Buddhist uh, sites is translating to thinking about print culture and the intersections between those two. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, you would have seen it, but there's a um, great uh, article that she published in 2009 called Views of Japanese Temples and Shrines from Near and Far, Precinct Prints Prince of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, that's Artemis Asia uh, from 2008. That's a, um, uh, it, I presume um, uh, some of what you're talking about today is, is, is um, related uh, to that, uh, but uh, that's another um, uh, piece that uh, we've, uh, uh, I've signed off into my um, uh, students, uh, and especially for understanding really important uh, part of visual culture of that time that I think many people have overlooked. In many ways, um, the Edo period, uh, uh, Edo period and Buddhist art um, don't have um, a great deal to do with each other um, uh, in, in general, and so this is one of the really wonderful contributions that uh, Professor Powell is, uh, is, is making here. I saw, do I have this right? You were at Kyodai uh, for four years total? Yeah, so um, uh, this is a well-trained person. Um, uh, uh, Sherry studied at, um, uh, at Kyoto University in uh, uh, for a total of four years, and I think they, their depth and breadth, both from her uh, uh, graduate training in the United States at UW, uh, University of Washington, and um, at UCLA, plus Kyoto really um, gives, uh, gives her a great richness in terms of uh, her scholarship. Um, She's talked about, uh, she's written about a, a wide variety of things. There's a forthcoming article on uh, some archaeological material that I'm very interested in, in seeing. Um, but uh, another article that I've uh, used, and I've always loved this particular work, is called The Splitting Image of Boucher in Saioji Temple, and it's called in Japan. It's a really wonderful uh, piece. I think you might have seen it, where he's splitting his face down the middle. Um, and uh, um, it's a great uh, example of how she is able to illuminate a um, quirky iconography, or a unique iconography, uh, and put it in a much larger context. 
Um, I mentioned uh, uh, she studied at the University of Washington. Her thesis there, uh, this is probably dredging up uh, long uh, memories, is, um, was on Nyori and Kannon. Uh, the, um, uh, and Kannon is the, um, I think, uh, arguably the most important um, uh, cultic figure uh, figure of cultic devotion in Japan. And um, that uh, work that started already uh, in her uh, master's has uh, continued over time. And uh, she really is now the foremost expert, I think, in, um, in studying Kannon, uh, both um, uh, as a um, uh, religious icon, uh, as a religious figure, and a, as an art historical, um, uh, as art, art historical uh, concept. So. Um, and uh, her new book, um, uh, which we hope is coming out very soon, is Accounts and Images of Six Kannon Cult in uh, Japan. And um, that's looking at um, uh, sculptures, prints, a whole range of different material that I think will be a really uh, another great uh, contribution. And I think a... a um, uh, a culmination of many of the uh, uh, of the published articles and the work she's done on that, and I think we're, uh, the field is very much looking forward to that. So today, these different streams are coming together: um, the Edo period material and the Buddhist material. Um, in uh, her uh, in her um, uh, talk, and the title is "Printing Salvation: Sacred Images and Kannon Sites in Japan." Please uh, help me in welcoming Professor Fowler. Wow. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> I hope I can live up to that. I feel like I could go home right now. Um, this is a, really a wonderful opportunity to come to the University of Michigan. It's actually my second time, and I was here 13 years ago, and I remember that the audience was so kind and friendly, so I decided to be very relaxed and go with that uh, tradition, and I'm sure you will be nice to me today. I really want to thank the Center for Japanese Studies for inviting me. It's a great opportunity. And also for um, Kevin for hosting me, Kevin Carr, and then his um, interest in my work. I had no idea you were actually reading it and paying attention, so it really, really uh, means a lot to hear that. So I will begin. And my talk is in two parts. We're going to look at the Saikoku 33 Kannon pilgrimage and its relationship to icon prints, the actual prints of the images on the temple. And then part two will be about illustrating the miraculous stories of the Saikoku, Saikoku uh, 33 Kannon pilgrimage. And those will be more of a popular nature. So this is interesting. Your introduction goes with what I'm <laughs> how I'm going to present this. I was um, driving down from Washington to California. I was a graduate student, so these things all do go together. And I stopped in at the Stanford Museum of Art, and I saw this strange scroll on the wall, and I thought, what what is that? It's really um, odd looking. There's a <clears throat> scroll that has gold in it, and it has these individual prints that were cut out like paper dolls and pasted onto it. And I thought, who would do that? Why would you cut up a Buddhist print? Why would you make this odd thing? And I had no idea what it was. And I, and I, I sort of thought about it, and I came back years later, and I actually went to the um, museum, and the curator showed it to me, and he said, oh, it's a Saikoku pilgrimage scroll, and he showed me pictures of the back, and, and it still wasn't what I was working on. It was just one of those things in the back of my mind that keeps uh, resurfacing. And here's another picture of it. So the Saikoku um, pilgrimage prints, here's one. And uh, what do you know? It's Nyoidin Kannon from Temple 18, the Rokakudo. So the, this is painted on, but this is part is paper that's been cut out and pasted. So I'm interested in how these things are put together and, and perform as a unit. So we'll, we'll get back to this, and I think it's ex important that I explain something else about the pilgrimage and who Kanon is for you to get an idea about what's going on here. Now, um, this is so basic. I think everybody in here has already studied this, but just to make sure that we're on the same page. Who is Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva? And I have all the different languages here. I'm really going to be talking about the Japanese context, so I'll stick with Kannon, um, Bodhisattva, Bosatsu there. And what I've been thinking about for a lot of my life is, is how, how, why are there so many of them? <laughs> why are there so many different forms of this deity? And um, how can we account for them? 
So it really is spelled out in the Lotus Sutra. And if you don't know what that is, it's a really important Buddhist text. It was translated into Chinese about the third century. And it is shorthand, it's called the Kannon Sutra for the part that's just on Kannon. So it's really um, focusing on that specific deity who is a compassionate savior. And many, many people, as Kevin mentioned, feel very close to Kannon and um, treasure the sutra and, and really relate to the deity very personally. The Lotus Sutra spells out that Kannon takes 33 bodies or guises to save human beings. Some of them are female, some of them are children. And this is a um, little detail from a scroll at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's from the 13th century, and it's really gorgeous. And it shows children preaching to other children. So Kannon can take the guise of a child in order to relate best to that person in order to save them. So it's an interesting concept. And it really... 33 becomes the magic number for Kannon, but in reality, there are many, many more forms than just 33. So um, in the sutra, it's really wonderful because it tells about all kinds of um, problems that Kannon can save you from. So if somebody is, is uh, trying to attract, attack you and rob you, Kannon can save you. If you're having a problem with a flood or a fire, you um, call on Kannon's name shipwrecks too, and um, Kanon will come and save you. So this pilgrimage is in the western part of Japan, and this is too small and, and not really appropriate to show, but I want to just have it there, that those are all the names of the different temples. Here's the root, here's one, kind of goes like this around the so Lake Biwa for number 33. You don't have to go in order, but... Um, it is set up so you can visit each one and think about the Kannon icon that is there, and the pilgrimage gives you religious merit. So if you are going, you upgrade your karma, and um, this is extremely popular. There are lots of pilgrimages in Japan, and many of them are dedicated to Kannon, but the Saikoku is the foremost uh, popular one. So the prints, these are the kinds of things that are handed out at the temple. Well, handed out isn't quite right. I mean, you have to, have to buy them. They um, are available on site, and you <clears throat> go up to the window, and you ask for, um, you can say an osugata, or a, you can call it something else, a mie, or, or um, an image of the, or ofuda, an image of the main icon at the temple, and they're really in inexpensive. Nowadays, it's, you know, 100 yen, 200 yen maybe. So they're not um, artworks. They're not really fancy. And so a lot of people have ignored them for a long time. So I've been trying to track down these things and, and look at them as part of visual culture, but it's not been easy because they're not really available. So I, I guess that's good for an art historian to, to dive in and look at these things because nobody's paid as much attention to them. Um, but it's a challenge. So this one is from temple number one, and you can see, oh, it's Nyoin Kanon again, and um, this is just an idea of what they look like. They make a connection to the icon for the pilgrim, and you can feel like you have a relationship with that image and that if you get this, it's it becomes more personal for you. And the other thing about it, it's like a portrait. So this word is, it's kind of, there's, there's some other words that are close to this that mean a portrait. So you think even if the person isn't with you, there's that closeness you feel if you've got something small that you can hold on to and, and have this relationship. So we can think about it in, in that way. They're, they're kind of intermediaries between the pilgrim and the um, icon. Now, the icon is back in here. And the thing that really fascinated me about this is because you can go on the pilgrimage, you can go to these places, you're making the effort, and you don't get to see the image. So that kind of thing 
is so disturbing for an art historian, but really doesn't seem to bother the pilgrims one bit. So they come in and they um, obviously can take pictures. <laughs> You can, you can do your prayers and engage in the pilgrimage activity, but seeing the image isn't as important as um, one might imagine. So I haven't made as much effort going to the temples as I should have because it wasn't the, the, my goal as an art historian initially. Now, the pilgrimage began in the 11th century when we look back through the history, and it really... The, the, the first people to do it were monks. It's very difficult to travel. And they were, um, <clears throat> you know, practicing very seriously. It became uh, very popular beginning in the 16th century. Travel was more available to a wide range of people. So people could go on a pilgrimage. It's actually an excuse to go somewhere. You'd have a reason. You could get a permit, and you could go easily, and you would not just do um, serious religious contemplation. You could also have lots of fun. So there are lots of stories and Edo period literature about that, about what people did along the way. So sometimes you get to see the icons, but not always. And what interests me is that how the prints show an image of, uh, or a picture of that icon, but it doesn't necessarily look like the artist saw it. So how do they do that? How do they convey the special features of that image that you can't even see? So this particular one, it's kind of an odd sculpture. It's 10th century, and it you know has some oddities here. This is the only color picture I could find of it. And it's not the fact that it's 10th century. It is um, an important registered work of art, but that's not the thing that people have um, made when they recreate its image. It's got this unusual lotus mandorla that's dated to 1702, and that's the kind of thing that the artist picked up on and used to identify it. That's its special feature that shows up in the prints. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So here's a print, and really it doesn't look too much like it, but we can see this. We can see this strange lotus leaf halo that's not um, something that you usually see, and it's not the kind of things that art historians study at all. It's like, who who cares about the 18th century thing? You know, it's it's sort of ruining the integrity. Some people have thought that and then didn't pay any attention to it at all, but it's very important to the artist to use it to identify the image. So I'm on the lookout for these kind of things, and, and I appeal to my audience here to tell me if you see these things. Um, this one is in the Harvard Library, and it's a large one, and here it is again. This one has very prominently showing us the lotus leaf mandorla, and if we need any help here, we can get the identification there. And that's a large one. That Sometimes people could um, buy it and have it mounted as a single image. And again, it's, it wasn't something that was very expensive, so um, it's not at the art museum. And here it is in the Stanford Scroll. This one's really pretty minimal, but we can look at this, even if we don't read this, we can say, okay, there it is, because none of the others have this strange uh, lotus leaf halo. Okay, so I want to take us to another temple on the um, route. This is Mimuro Doji, and it's number 10. It's in Uji, and that's the outside of it. And inside, it's icon. This is really um, strange. So uh, it, the, the, uh, many of the, as I said, many of the temple icons in, in Saikoku are secret images. And there's a practice of this in Japan. It's called hibutsu, where um, the images are kept in a closed shrine and only open on special occasions. So this one is not the main image. It's one that's in front. There's the main images inside. We can't see that very well. That's the doors open. Here's the closed shrine doors, which is most of the time. 
And then here's this wooden image out in front. It's called a maidachi. It's out in front, and it stands in place of the secret one that you can't see. So it is a thousand-armed kanon, but it doesn't seem to look like it has a thousand arms. It's, it looks like a strange um, 7th century bronze. This image was um, opened in 2009. So I thought, what's in there? Do we finally get to see it? What, what does it look like? This is the only photo that I found. <laughs> Isn't that helpful? Um, but they're very proud of their image uh, tradition of, of when it's been opened and when it's not. So they, they, the website actually tracks. Um, it has documented each time that um, they know that it was open. So theoretically, it's supposed to be once every 33 th years. That's the Kanon's magic number. But if you look at, do the math, um, it's not. <laughs> it seems to be, when was a special occasion that they decided to open it up? In 2009, all of the images were open um, on the Saikoka route. But um, if you go to a secret image opening, as an art historian, you might be very disappointed because you, you're far away and you often don't get to see it. So that's there. I'm looking for more. I, I imagine that if it were a fantastic 7th century image that somebody would have gotten in there and, and shared the photos with us. So here is um, this. Here's a thousand arm kanon image, as we might expect it to look. Really has a thousand arms and all these wonderful things in it. The hands can help save the person. But at Mimono Doji, the um, <clears throat> icon looks like this. Two images, it's kind of, it, it's imitating the seventh century style. If we look at the, the legends about the temple, there's a story that the founder was um, meditating at a pond and wishing that he had an image, and the image flew out of the pond and jumped onto his sleeve, and that's how it came to the temple, and it was small. The legends have the measurement, so I'm imagining that there's something um, that they decided to copy what a, a, what a um, small bronze image looked like. So I may never know what, how that actually came about. What I can think about and look at is how do the prints show us this strange um, form? This is a thousand-arm kanon. That's unusual, but they want us to see that here's that style so we can recognize it and, and kind of have a closeness to that unusual form. So it's about explaining what is, what is um, not obvious to us. So just a quick little note about um, how to do a pilgrimage. I think you've probably done this, many of you. And um, I really wanted to find out the exact protocol. Like, what do you do about that? The best place to find that is, of course, on the internet. And that's where the pilgrimage uh, shops <laughs> tell you exactly how to do it, which is good. So um, you come in, you bow here. You might purify your hands in a basin. You can ring the bell. You go up the stairs to the main hall. You can... Um, recite your prayers and there's an order for what you do. The minimum is to um, recite the Heart Sutra and people can do this really quickly because there are tour buses. You can compartmentalize your um, pilgrimage experience and do it very, very rapidly. And um, I, I was watching this group of people do that and I was impressed and they were like, okay, oh, we're, we're done and then back to the bus. But before you jump on that bus, you must shop. That's very important. So um, at the shop, you can buy something like this. Here's one of these modest prints that I was talking about. But what has become really <clears throat> exciting for people is to get a temple a seal and um, a calligraphy by one of the monks there. So it costs, what, $5 or so to get this. And they actually do it for you. It's very nice. And um, you can, you can uh, buy all kinds of other things. And then you can also get these, which are, here's a nice image of Kanon, and you can get a whole scroll, and you can get each seal and can collect the whole set and then um, have that signed when you complete the pilgrimage. So it's, it's, a, it's another way to, to do this. These are, you know, individual goodies that you can get at the, at the site. So if you can't go there... You can go on the internet and go to one of these shops, and here's the target audience right here. Um, 
um, and so I was interested in, okay, so they're still making these. These are the icon prints, and, and what do you do with that if you're not going to mount it on your scroll? Because that's, you know, a really big investment. You can buy one of these books, and that's less costly. So you can, you know, collect one or collect a whole set. So it's a um, really interesting phenomenon that continues. And, oh, here's a close-up of them doing the calligraphy. They're really good, and I've listened to people talk about this, and that there's a hierarchy behind the desk, like who's really good at it, and they're, they're, they, they watch, and, and people are, are quite invested in this. And there's also um, YouTube videos of the whole process now. There's people, you know, foreigners going to Japan. Look, I collected this, and then this is how to do it. And I thought, oh, you kids have it so easy. Um, <laughs> So there's a whole, this has no icons, it's just the seals and an abbreviated name of the building. And here's the seal book. And these are for completing the whole pilgrimage. You can have this book, and I've been learning that these are very, very precious to people and often end up um, with the person when they die because it's like a passport to the next world, and also I think that it, it develops out of the idea of um, a receipt for having finished your sutra copying, and also it relates to um, passports for travel during the Edo period, how important that was to have documentation that it was completed. So not everyone can go on a pilgrimage. This is thousands of kilometers, the whole thing. So it's a big commitment to do it. Not everyone can do it. And, and then, you know, there are various reasons. Sometimes you want to transfer the merit to somebody who's ill, and somebody who's ill certainly can't go. There are stories in the Edo period about people who died along the way, but they, that was a good situation for them in that case. So there are virtual pilgrimage. This is, people have done work on this. There are lots of different um, modes of this, but uh, recently I was in Kyushu and I saw this really out in the country, nobody around, here are all these images, there's no sign even. So that fell off and people just still know, oh, okay, that's the Saikoku pilgrimage. What you can do is get the credit, get the merit by going and praying one stop, and you can get the karmic credit for um, the whole pilgrimage all at once. So I love this one because it's very modest, but it shows um, the power of abbreviating and how you can accomplish that similar idea. So painted pilgrimage scrolls were um, made that are so different from what I'm thinking about right now. I mean, these are really finely done works with expensive materials. This one's from the 14th century. It's one of the oldest. Um, and if you look in uh, Dr. Carr's book, you'll see another nice early one that he showed. They are um, <clears throat> showing the pilgrimage icons all together and you know, and as an expression of the whole pilgrimage together, you get the karmic merit if you are sponsoring an image. So why do these things? Why make these things? You are um, upgrading your karma, which is um, nice for the rest of us to get to see this wonderful thing. So these are the kind of things that you do find as the studies of art historians and in museums. And these are the kinds of things that you usually don't. Uh, again, Harvard has a collection of things. This is not um, Saikoku, it's actually Chichibu, but it's all the pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage icons done at once in a wood block. So it's not collecting each one. You get them all together stamped. And then um, this is the wood block. This is the oldest one that I've been able to f find from 1544. Um, again, it's big. It's um, stamp it all at once, and then you get that at the, the temple that... Um, is sponsoring that specific thing. So in the 19th century in Japan, copper plate printing was developed, and it's really fine. So this is this is so um, strange because here this is inches, so you can see how the actual size is from the British Museum. You can fit the whole pilgrimage in your hand. 
So it's really precious. I started to just love these things once my eyes started going because they're so hard to see and they're so precious. But you have the, um, it, the, the description of the icon and then you have over here um, parts of the Lotus Sutra and all these things that Kanon can do. And it's not just 33 uh, uh, temple, um, temples of the Psychoku pilgrimage. They added three more. So people are always people. Well, temples are always doing this, getting into the act by making themselves auxiliary or supernumerary uh, temples. So um, <clears throat> I've been helping out with an exhibition on Avalokiteshvara that's going to happen in, in um, April in Vassar. And this is going to be in the show, which is really unusual to have this, this at the museum. But it is one of these pilgrimage scrolls with the different icons pasted all to it. And this is the best I could get for the detail. But it has an interesting inscription that helps us learn more about how these work. And what we find here on the back is that a... Um, Man took a pilgrimage, and he went to all the places. He collected the prints, and he had a desire to um, mount them as a scroll, but he died unexpectedly. And then his son, who was a filial son, decided to do this in his name. So he had the scroll mounted, and then to, to have this completed, you get a monk's signature over here, he signed it, and then the man's name is here. We have uh, we have the son's name in here, but the man's name is here and it's long. It's like a, a a name that you get when you die. It's something that the temples bestow on you. But there's a woman's name too, and I'm thinking, is that his mother? It doesn't really say anything about her. And when I'm looking into these things, you you actually don't have to die to get this name. You can be a temple patron and and get one as well. So um, I'm, I'm on this hunt to find out more of them, and this is a black and white picture, but um, <clears throat> here's another one. The description in the catalog says that gold was added and colors were added, so it's enhancing those very modest pilgrimage prints and then making it into something grander. I wish I had the inscription for that when I don't. And then um, things keep happening. If you look on the internet periodically uh, or all the time, <laughs> um, this is on display right now. There's a there's a show at the Ethnographic Museum in Zurich of a monk, uh, sorry, monk, a pastor, a Swiss pastor who was collecting these things in Japan, and then he donated them to the museum. And now they're like, oh, this is pretty interesting, and so they're making an exhibition. And here we have one of these that. Um, puts them all together. So I'm, I don't know, maybe I'll get to go to that. Maybe not. <laughs> um, back to Stanford. So here we have, I was able to get the back of it and then have some help read this because it's, it's uh, very difficult. It's in Chinese. Um, but it explains that a monk named Seiku went on the pilgrimage 10 times. So he went 10 times and um, completed it, it took 10 years, and completed it in 1883. And the um, monk from Zenkoji came to the area of Osaka and signed the scroll. And then all of these are people's names and family names. So this is dedicated to 103 different people, and they're, they're probably deceased. It's a pilgrimage um, support group. <laughs> it's, a, it's a group that um, sponsored this. So I don't know if they gave him the money. I don't know if this was the only one that he did, but he collected those and did this. So it's transferring the merit of this really um, splendid act of doing it 10 times, because each time he did it probably took him several months. So that's transferring to those, those people. So um, that was uh, an interesting thing to find out. And then um, on my own um, campus, we have this. So this is a print screen, and it has all these pasted onto it. And um, Rob, it's real friend. <laughs> um, and it has a picture of Amida. This is later. This is maybe, I don't know, from the 1950s or something. And when we analyze all the prints, they're all mixed up. It's not one single pilgrimage. It's all kind of put together. And about 10 years ago, 
the curator said, are you interested in this? I said, heck yes, I am. And the, I met the donor recently and she said, oh, I had that in my house and my dogs are running into it. And um, she said, I just decided to donate it to the museum. I said, would you please thank those dogs for me? So um, I, I'm very happy we have this and it um, helps us think about different things. I, I wish it had an inscription, but it doesn't. So just to kind of sum this part up, um, how do these small prints function? And they're proof of a pilgrimage, they're souvenirs, they can be thought of as, you know, cheap and expensive souvenir, or they can be very personal and precious. And they make a connection between the icon, and they also can be used to transfer and gain merit, and they also can commemorate the dead. And then, you know, thinking about that, that tremendous scroll with all those names on the back of it, it's like these things can be used to console the living because living people want to help the dead, but they also want to help themselves. So you feel really helpless when somebody goes, you want to do something about it. And I think that's part of the importance and process for these. Um, all right, I'm, I'm, I got to get to part two. We're going to look at some miraculous stories. But right before we do that, I need to remind everyone that printed culture in the Edo period was just booming and there's so many books I know people here are working on that and um, this is a guidebook to the Kanon pilgrimage and the guidebooks have um, practical information they tell you how to get to the place and they also tell you where to eat where it's a good restaurant where to stay that kind of thing so it's another um, element but um, what I want to concentrate on are these um, popular prints that address the pilgrimage and this particular one is um, by Hiroshige II and Kunisada, fa famous print artists who were working mainly in popular um, print culture. But here we have a Buddhist theme, and we can see how they present this in a completely different way. And, well, not completely different, actually. We have the temple grounds up here. It looks like a framed situation there's a this is a set of 33 and there's actually a group of them that put three pilgrimages together and you get a set of 100 because one of the pilgrimages has uh, 34 in it and <clears throat> they were very popular for a time but then at the very end um about i think about eight of them they stopped printing them they didn't get completed maybe they people weren't as interested as they expected but they must have sold well enough so let me tell you the story about this. This is um, Kannonji, also known as Kannon Shoji. And one day, Shotoku Taishi was walking along <laughs> the uh, river, and out of this um, river came this strange being, half fish and half human. And she said, uh, um, oh, won't you help me? I have... Um, I was a fisherman, and I enjoyed killing, and so I was reborn this way. Can't you do something to save me? If you will build a temple on this spot and make a thousand-armed kanon image, I can be saved. So, of course, it's Shotoku Taishi. I think you've heard of him before. He's this prince who was promoting Buddhism. Lots of legends about him. He, uh, of course, he did it, and he held a seven-day ritual for her afterwards, and well, she flew out of the sky and said, thank you very much. I've been saved, and um, all was well. So uh, I have another picture of that. I wasn't sure which one is better. Oh, that's odd. <laughs> Please come back. Hmm, my picture is missing. Oh, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, that's the first time that's ever happened. Where's the young man <laughs> who was helping with the technology? Did he leave? Is it showing up on your screen at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is past the uh, laptop run. Oh, no, it's, uh, oh, so it's here. Oh. That one didn't come out. So it's, but it's not showing up here. Huh. Okay. Okay, well, we'll just look at this one. 
That, but I'm, I'm disappointed. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so what, what, what I had there, but that's all right, because um, um, we want to move faster. So what happened was this was um, uh, remade, and you'd see over and over again this printed as a gorgeous woman coming out, half fish, half um, strange creature, or a beautiful woman and a half fish. So... Um, <clears throat> I found this book at a used bookstore, and it's really weird. So here, instead of a beautiful woman, we have um, there's the fish mermaid talking to Shotoku Taishi, having this conversation, and it's just so creepy. And I thought, well, what what's happening here? Instead of you know showing us the beautiful woman theme that is really part of ukiyo-e in the print tradition, they opted to show us the bazaar. So. Where does that come from? Well, um, oh, good. I'm glad that's there. <laughs> so, uh, at Kanon Shoji, they have a mermaid, or they did have a mermaid. And um, these strange taxidermy things were made in the 19th century and sold to Dutch people. And um, then in, in 2000, the year 2000, they brought them back. They had an exhibition. It was Dutch-Japan relationship. And... Um, I happened to be there and I thought, oh, um, that's great. So um, it's a, a mermaid. And then I found this one. This was the Kanon Shoji mermaid that they had on display at the temple. And this is in 1987. Ian Reeder, who's a um, pilgrimage specialist, took this picture and then posted this on the internet. But um, the temple burnt down in, 1993, in, in 1993, and they rebuilt the temple. They remade the thousand-armed Kanon image, wonderful image, but no mermaid. <laughs> so um, I, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, I have another one more story to tell you, and this is part of the, um, <clears throat> the pilgrimage series. This is from Mimuro Doji, and which it should say that we've talked about this temple before. And this, again, shows not the icon of the temple, not the founding legend, and we don't even have a kanon at all, but what we do have is a story about a woman who had very, very strong faith in kanon. So here's the story. She was such a kind person that she never wanted to kill anything, ever. And she was, she's a farm girl, and she was walking along in her uh, village, and she saw a man who was about ready to kill a crab and eat it. And, um, right, so, so um, she said, no, stop, don't do that, and I will trade you. I'll give you a dried fish if you'll let that crab go. So he did that, and, you know, that, that all worked out very nicely. Then, later, her father was plowing in his field, and he saw a snake trying to eat a frog. And the, he said, stop, don't do that. Um, tried to stop the, the snake from eating the frog. And, and he said, he didn't know what to do. He's like well, panicking. And so he said, I'll give you my daughter if you let that frog go. He was joking. And um, so, of course, the uh, snake spit out the frog and then, and then said, mm, I'll be back. And he showed up. I'll be back in three days. So he shows up and said, here I am, and he's a man, and um, I'm ready for my, your, my uh, reward, your daughter. And he says, no, 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 come back in three days, and then we'll see what's going to happen. So the daughter went into her room, sealed herself up in the room, and read the Kanon Sutra, devout faith in the Mimuro Doji Kanon, really concentrated, shut herself up. Then on the third day, um, he breaks down the door of the room with his tail and rushes in. Just at that moment, he's attacked by thousands of crabs and they rip him to shreds. And, oh, and he dies. So, um, so the, uh, the moral of the story is repayment of kindness. And she let the crab go, so the crab was repaying her when she was in need. And if a crab, a mere crustacean, can repay a kindness, and we humans ought to be able to do the same, okay? So um, this gets repeated over and over again, and this, this one was really shocking because I thought that's a really direct ripoff, 
And it turns out that um, the artist of this print is named um, Baido Kunimasa, and he worked underneath Kunisada, so it was a sanctioned copying. So that's not so outrageous. Uh huh. What was that chocolate cedar herb there? It's her incense burner. So her incense burner was on. She's you know has her incense lit right here, and then he brushes into the room and it falls into the ground. So that's showing this dramatic moment. So there's a dramatic moment. This is another. There are so many of these, I couldn't believe it. And the uh, database at um, the uh, Diet Library has 50 of them. I had no idea. So, um, oh, and there's the missing one. But, but that's OK. Now we have the weird one. Um, this is the one that I found. And um, here is here he is. He looks like a strange kabuki actor. There's the crabs trying to attack him. She's not really paying attention. Her incense burner hasn't even fallen on the floor. But um, this uh, it 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 you know have the icon here. So it's we have the story, and then there's a little bit of extra here to make us a relationship with the icon. But um, it's not emphasized, so that's not what's important and been. Um, this is the strangest experience, <laughs> and I guess it makes sense because I'm talking somewhat about um, hidden images. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I had something there, but it's we're not going to look at it because it's it's concealed, and that's okay. <laughs> so um, I'll just finish, and I think I will just read you. To sum up, let's consider the relationship of two 19th century prints to the main icon of the temple. The one on the right shows a modest print of the Mimuro Doji Kanon. This type of print was made to create a personal connection, Kechian, between the pilgrim and the icon, and also functions like a souvenir or pilgrimage receipt. On the left, the colorful ukiyo-e print from 1858 does not even show the Kanon image or even illustrate the founding legend of the temple the miraculous image. Instead, the print dramatically illustrates a woman's unwavering faith in a Kanon image that is not shown. And indeed, within this set of 33 prints, none of them featured the temple's icon. While the print also includes a picture of the temple grounds, it was made and sold off-site through a commercial enterprise. This popular print was made to stimulate sales, but in a way, it serves to enhance the mystique of the secret image of Kanon by leaving it out of the picture. Thank you.